If you look closely, and maybe if you've been doing a lot of graphing lately, you'll start seeing the same symmetrical U-shaped curve all around you. Stop for a sip at one of those old-fashioned metal water fountains, and you'll likely be drinking to the peak of what looks like a tiny parabola, a shape first studied in ancient Greek geometry and made by slicing a cone in a particular way. Or take a gander at the path of a jumping fish, grasshopper, kangaroo, or frog, another parabola. And the main cables of suspension bridges are pulled into parabolas by the forces of gravity and compression. It's the same pattern, sometimes bigger or smaller or narrower or fatter, but not all of them are true parabolas, but an impressive number of the phenomena you notice will be parabolas, at least in ideal circumstances. With so many different manifestations of parabolas out there, it seems like each one could have a vastly different equation, but no. While there's plenty of unique and complex math underlying the hydraulics of a drinking fountain or the leaf of a kangaroo, the basic parabolas are all versions of the same thing. And the same is true for the parabolas you'll find in college algebra. They all may look a little different, but each one can be graphed as a variation on a single quadratic theme. G'day, I'm James Tanton, and this is Study Hall Algebra, presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. Parabolas were first described by ancient Greek scholars with words and geometry. It would take over a thousand more years before algebra was invented, and we could describe them with equations, all of which are variations of the simple y equals x squared. Now, no matter what we're graphing, a surefire way to get started is to plug in some numbers into the equation as x values and see what matching y values make the equation true. Zero squared is zero. So x equals zero and y equals zero make our equation a true sentence. Then one squared is one, and negative one squared is also one. Two and negative two squared are four. Three and negative three squared are nine. And we can keep going until we're sure of the general shape. Here, we're pretty sure that if we plug in bigger positive or negative x values, we will always get bigger y values. Here, we're working from an equation. So drawing a line connecting the dots is really just imagining we've plugged in all the numbers and plotted all the data. In this graph, the vertex, or the point where the curve changes direction, is at zero. It's the low point of the graph, or the minimum. And that's it. That's the graph of the only parabola we'll ever need. Well, looks like we've made good time. Wow, golly geez, beautiful outside. Okay, that might be a little hasty. But jokes aside, the graph of any other quadratic equation is just this plot transformed. The basic symmetry always stays the same, which is kind of magical. Almost like y equals x squared as a chameleon. Or maybe there's a secret mathematical chameleon helping us with all the possible transformations. Well, we can dream. Before we get started, let's see what we're working with. Remember, a standard quadratic equation looks something like y equals ax squared plus bx plus c where x is our variable and a, b, and c are constants. So with a equal to one and b and c equal to zero, y equals x squared is the simplest quadratic relationship out there. But what happens to the graph if we have an a that's different from one? Well, if our graphing chameleon makes a equal to one half, the y values will only be half of what they were before. And snap, the parabola is shallower and wider. And if she transforms a into two, then the y values will be twice what they were before and the graph will look narrower and steeper. You can think of messing with the a coefficient as adjusting the arms of the parabola. Smaller a values force the arms to lay flatter, while larger a values bring the arms up closer together. Now, all throughout these adjustments, the vertex is still at zero and stays the lowest point. Now, let's have it bring back our original y equals x squared graph. What if the a term were negative, like y equals negative x squared? We can probably figure it out before plotting it. Our y values are going to be the opposite of what they were before, so the arms stretch down instead of up. But if we flip our graph, where do we put zero? Well, negative zero squared is still zero. So in this graph, the vertex is still at zero. But now it's the high point, the maximum, rather than the low point, the minimum. For quadratic equations, the vertex anchors the rest of the curve. And it's often the most interesting part of the graph when the math is describing something in the real world. It's important to know the minimums and maximums of graphs, which are the lowest and highest points we've been talking about. The maximum, for example, can tell us how high the rock launched from our backyard trebuchet will go. Now, in all of these graphs so far, the vertex has been stuck at the origin, where x equals zero and y equals zero. We've only worked with the a coefficient so far, and that didn't shift the vertex from zero. So we're going for a transformation where the vertex is somewhere else. The b and c terms must handle the action here. There's actually a way to rewrite quadratic equations to let us understand what the b and c terms do to our parabola. By completing the square like we did when we first explored quadratic equations, we can give y equals ax squared plus bx plus c a shiny new look called vertex form. The point h comma k is actually the vertex, and we can read it right off the equation. If we just have an a value, like in y equals x squared, or y equals 2x squared, or y equals negative x squared, we can see that h is zero and k is zero. Our vertex for all these parabolas is at the origin, just like we've seen so far in all our graphs. Could you come up with something a little more complicated? Oh, that's good. Now let's try converting this tricky equation to vertex form by completing the square. So x times x is x squared. That's straightforward. 
We need a negative 2 and a negative 2 to add up to negative 4x, and those multiply to 4, but our c term outside the parentheses is 3, so we'll need to subtract 1. And we have y equals x minus 2, all squared, minus 1. So where is the vertex? h is 2 because we have x minus h squared, and the subtraction there is built into the vertex formula. It doesn't mean that whatever the number h is must be negative. But because it's plus k in the vertex formula, our k value is negative 1. We can think of it as plus negative 1, which is just negative 1. So we've got the same answer. Our vertex is still at the point 2, comma, negative 1. In fact, by completing the square, we see that every quadratic equation really looks like y equals a, x minus h all squared, plus k in disguise. They all have the same structure. And so we've confirmed we always get the same symmetrical U-shaped parabola. It just might have been transformed a bit. In fact, we can put symmetry to work and get a rough sketch of any quadratic equation without much work at all. First, let's take the same equation as we had before. We can rewrite the equation by pulling out a common factor of x from the first two terms to get y equals x times x minus 4 plus 3. Now we see that x equals 0 makes y equals 3, and x equals 4 also makes y equals 3, because both 0 and 4 make the first part 0. That means there are two points for the same y value, 0, 3 and 4, 3, and we already know the graph is symmetrical. The line of symmetry must fall halfway between 0 and 4, namely at x equals 2. So the vertex is somewhere on that line of symmetry, and 2 has to be its x value. But where? Well, plug in x equals 2, and we see that y equals 4 minus 8 plus 3 equals negative 1. The vertex is at the point 2 comma negative 1, the same place we deduced it was before by converting the equation into vertex form. Now let's take a look at one of those classic applications of graphing quadratics, projectile motion. Around the turn of the 17th century, the astronomer and mathematician Galileo did a lot of work on projectile motion and deduced that all objects fall at the same rate of acceleration due to gravity, or about negative 16 feet per second squared. This led to the discovery that heights of objects in motion follow this quadratic formula where v is how fast we throw the object up, and d is how high we start above the ground. Now, if we're throwing something, it's easy to see a parabola in the actual path of the projectile, like a ball flying back and forth in an arc. But most of the time, we throw objects at an angle, so the velocity is a mix of vertical motion, height changing over time, and horizontal motion that spreads those changing heights over time. And these two directions are a bit harder to model and need more variables, so a quadratic equation won't be enough. That's why in algebra class, things are thrown straight up, so we can represent them with quadratic equations. The variable on the horizontal axis of the projectile is time, and the variable on the vertical axis is height. Maybe you want to launch something up that won't come down, at least not in the same form, like a firework. It's super important to calculate the maximum height of a firework, because you don't want it to go off too soon after it's launched, and you especially don't want it to go off when it's falling back down. So if you know the launch speed of your firework, how do you know how long its time delay fuse should burn before it explodes? So let's put on those safety goggles to have a closer look. Let's say you and your local fire department have been assigned to set off some of those celebratory fireworks from the bridge over a nearby lake. To set your fuse properly, you want to find how long it takes the fireworks to reach their maximum height. And from Galileo's work, we know the height of a falling object is h equals negative 16 t squared plus v times t plus d. You know the fireworks launch upward at 200 feet per second, so their initial velocity v is 200. And the bridge is 75 feet above the water, so the initial height d is 75. The variables might be different, but this equation is recognizably a quadratic so we know its graph is going to be a parabola. The a coefficient here is negative 16, which means our graph is going to be upside down and narrower than y equals x squared. And in fact, the vertex will be the maximum. Since b and c are both non-zero, that vertex will not be at the origin. So to sketch a quick graph, we can find two points for the same y value. And if we write the equation like this, we can notice that time t equals zero and t equals 12.5, the height of the firework above the water is 75 feet. Then since the graph is symmetric, the fireworks reach their maximum height halfway between those two times at t equals 6.25 seconds. Plug that in, and our fireworks will launch 700 feet into the air. We can even learn a bit more from the graph. If we extend our sketch, the parabola's arms will cross the horizontal axis when h equals 0, or at the roots we discussed in episode 9. The positive root is somewhere between t equals 12 and t equals 13. So the graph tells us that your fuse needs to be set so that the fireworks go off up to 6.25 seconds when they're 700 feet up in the air, and we'll be back on Earth just before 13 seconds are up. Now look at all these quadratics we've graphed, a fireworks-worthy accomplishment. So, when setting out on transformations of your own, remember that all graphs of quadratic equations are essentially just graphs of y equals x squared, just flattened or widened or shifted around. And the vertex form of a quadratic equation lets you read off the vertex h, k right away. Remember that h is being subtracted from x, so if you're something like y equals x plus 1 squared plus 3, h must really be negative 1. But to easily graph a quadratic, Use the symmetry of the parabola. We write it as y equals x times ax plus b plus c, and find the two x values that give the same y value c. Halfway between those points is the line of symmetry and the vertex. Next time, let's revisit linear equations and see how graphing can even help us solve simultaneous equations. Until then, 
Cheers. Thanks for watching Study Hall Algebra, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us at Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.